Okay, Lou, so if you un unmute yourself and um, we'll be ready to go. Is the unmute button. Um, okay. There we go. Yeah. Um, just a moment. Great. All right. Now everything's copacetic. Absolutely. All right. This is this talk is called Knot Experiments, and it is about experiments with knots in various directions. Some of them are notational or iconic and have to do with logic and other things, and some of them uh, are actual experiments with real knots or real computer knots. And um, the first experiment is one that you actually should do if you've never done it before. Escher did it, uh, as you can see. Uh, Escher took a, a three-half twisted Mobius band with planaria, made out of a living planaria, as you see, but um, a three half twisted Mobius band, and he cut it down the middle. And he found that he got a trefoil knot. Um, I've uh, unfortunately revealed the joke. Uh, it's much better to have somebody, uh, uh, yourself or someone else, actually make it out of paper. And you wouldn't expect a trefoil knot to appear necessarily, and then you cut it, and uh, it opens up, and and it is obviously a trefoil knot, as you see from Escher's drawing. So that's a very nice experiment in the production of knots from non-orientability. Um, so, as I said, the theme of this talk is topological connection and logical connection. Um, and I'm going to be talking about diagrams. Diagrams embody relationships and pattern that can pivot among known and yet to be known context. And will illustrate the theme with topological examples that impinge on physics, biology, and language. And here are some quasi syllogisms for you to read. Uh, simplest diagrams, a circle maybe, indicating the concurrence of an inside and an outside to form a whole from which a distinction can be made. Or a circle is drawn in a plane space, making a distinction between inside and outside. And from a single circle indicating one distinction, you can go to multiplicity as in the Venn diagram on this page. This diagram, using a notation due to Lewis Carroll, which I wish to discuss in a moment, indicates that some A or B and some B or C by the marks that indicate the possibly occupied regions. You see you have the regions A and B and a little marker which is a sitting on a fence between two regions and that little marker doesn't, uh, doesn't make the decision that either of those regions is occupied but says that at least one of them is occupied. And the other marker says that at least one of the other regions in the intersection of B and C is occupied. But then you see immediately that the syllogism doesn't work. Some A or B, some B or C doesn't imply that some A or C, because those markers could uh, drop their uh, content indications into disjoint regions. Syllogisms are best done without any symbolic logic and just a little bit of Venn diagrams as Lewis Carroll understood because he didn't have any symbolic logic and was inventing it. Um, and uh, his, uh, his notation involved um, um, squares cut up into squares cut up into squares and he could get the two to the n uh, compartments in logical space for n premises. Uh, very nicely with this notation, which is different from the Venn. But uh, the part I wanted to show you was the sitting on the fence. And so this is a quote. And now suppose I were ask you to represent with counters the contradictory to no red exists at all, that is some red exists, or putting letters for words, some X exists, how would you do it? This will puzzle you a little bit, I expect. Evidently, you must put a red counter somewhere in the X half of the cupboard, since you know there are some red apples. But you must not put it into the left-hand compartment, since you do not know them to be ripe. And nor may you put it into the right-hand one, since you do not know them to be unripe. 
what then are you to do? I think the best way out of the difficulty is to place the red counter on the division line between the XY compartment and the XY prime compartment. This I shall represent, as I always put one where you are to put a red counter by the diagram. Our ingenious American cousins have invented a phrase to express the position of a man who wants to join one or other of two parties, such as their two parties, Democrats and Republicans, but can't make up his mind which. Such a man is said to be sitting on the fence. Now that is exactly the position of the red counter you have just placed on the division line. He likes the look of number five, he likes the look of number six, but he doesn't know which to jump down into. So he sits there astride, silly fellow, dangling his legs, one on each side of the fence. And if you're a reader of uh, Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass, it does remind you of Humpty Dumpty sitting on the wall. Anyway, um, the invention of the counter that sits on the fence and the diagrammatic superposition of premises makes uh, all the logic you ever really need and, um, and uh, syllogisms and everything else are really completely transparent this way. We don't teach it this way. Um, uh, maybe that's why I'm telling you this because it's a complaint about education or maybe a push because if we if we would just stop teaching people truth tables and all of that and, and just teach them this, they would come out the other end understanding how to reason a little better instead of having become all confused by the truth tables. Of course you can get confused because you want to have quantifiers and you want to have all of the implications out in the open and Frege, who came around the same time as Boole and Venn and those people developed a notation that looks like this. It's quite interesting in the next topic in my little uh, run through here. This is what Frege's notation looked like, his logic diagrams. And it's actually very simple. It looks complicated, but it's very simple. Um, A implies B is this up on the top of the slide. Line under, take a 90 degree turn, bump into B. That's A implies B. So then you see a implies that B implies C is a tree going from left to right or right to left. Um, but A implies B implies C is a different tree. And so, uh, and so uh, all the distinctions between different aspects of implication are represented by the different tree structures in Frege's notation. And um, not is in a, uh, to negate a proposition completely is to put a little vertical line uh, on its line like that. So in the middle there, you have not A implies B. And in the bottom, you have not A implies B. And, uh, and then, of course, you want to represent equivalent things and you get to move things around a bit in Frege. For example, not that A implies B is the same as not B implies not A, and you have to swivel the tree and put the knots inside. Um, or if you want A and B, uh, which is the same as not the case that A implies not B, then you put a couple of knots in an implication and you can get and. All of this reminds you of what you do with, uh, with circuitry, but that came later. Uh, quite a bit later, after Shannon, whom I'm not mentioning here, um, and relations of Boolean algebra with switching circuits, and then later with things that are like this. But Frege had what essentially is an information flow diagram, something like a circuit diagram where the information is flowing from right to left, as you see. Um, and in fact, he had defined a category uh, and he had solved how non-associativity would be related to the things in his category by using tree structures that represent the different kinds of associations that are possible. So he would still have a category where compositions are associative, but he didn't know that at his time. Um, now, you know that A implies B is not A or B. That's what it means logically. Um, how can we relate that? Well, here's a solution to decoding uh, um, 
Frege's diagrams in a way that is related to this kind of decoding of implication. When you turn the corner, the knot will be applied. If you turn a corner, 90 degree corner, that'll be knot. And of course, you also have the other knot. And on the other hand, if you have two lines which join, that will be or. Um, not uh, unusual from our point of view when we're quite used to uh, circuit diagrams. But put those two together, you see, and the A goes along, turns 90 degrees and gets not, and then it goes oring with B, and you get not A or B. And then, once you have that, you could look at Frege's old diagrams and decode what they say in terms of or and not and 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 everything quite easily. For example, here's this triple implication. The A goes along, goes up, turns into a knot, the B goes along, ors with it, then you get a knot of that, and then you or that with a C, and you have this rather complicated expression, which I shan't read, which corresponds to A implies B implies C. Uh, in Spencer Brown, knot is given by putting a bracket, a 90 degree bracket around A, so another 90 degrees. Uh, this time the 90 degree is the Spencer Brown mark up over A. So you turn 90 degrees and put the Spencer Brown mark over A. You uh, bump into, let X and Y bump into each other and you just put them next to each other, that's the OR. So you see that if you now look at Frege and look at his A implies B, it comes out as cross AB, which is Spencer Brown's way of writing implication. So we have them both together. I don't think I'm talking about quantification here, but quantification involves little blips in the lines. And uh, since I want to get to knot theory, I won't bother you with that. But I can't resist telling you about another historical uh, uh, notation for implication due to Charles Sanders' purse. Peirce wrote a beautiful paper, which you can find the whole paper in Carolyn Isley's collection of Peirce's writings. Um, I could give you the reference if you're interested. And Peirce writes an article and he says, I shall represent implication, material implication, by this sign. And the sign is a 90 degree bracket, similar to Spencer Brown's, but it's got a little uh, marker on it. Is that sitting on a fence or what? What is that marker? Um, and and he, um, and he then writes down axioms for implication. It goes along for about 10 pages. And then he reveals the secret in the end. He says, actually, you can, if you like, think of my sign of elation as a combination of barring the A, which is negating it, and a plus sign between A and B. It is a portmanteau sign, like slithy. Uh, um, between the bar and the plus, and is therefore not A or B. Uh, and so it's a kind of a joke, but I, I couldn't tell by reading Peirce's paper whether he thought it was funny. Uh, maybe you could tell if you looked at his paper. I think it's hilarious myself. Um, and as you see, he discovered uh, Spencer Brown's mark prior to Spencer Brown, but a little differently, but very similar. Um, then um, I like to play with this 90 degree angle, which keeps coming in. And uh, a couple of years ago, somebody pointed out to me something that I wished I had learned when I was a kid, uh, that um, we all know that the square root of minus one is represented by a point 90 degrees from the real line horizontal and at unit distance from it over the origin. But who discovered that first? It's often said that it was discovered by Gauss and Argand around 1800. But these days, the net will tell you that it was discovered by John Wallace in his book on algebra. And John Wallace's uh, rationalization for that interpretation was, if you have a right triangle, and you drop H from the 90 degree angle down to the base, then you see by similar triangles that the square of H is equal to the product of the divisions of the, of the hypotenuse, H squared is AB. And so 
Wallace having in, having been a great proponent of the real line, including the negative numbers and the positive numbers, relatively new at that time, said, let's let A be minus one and B be plus one, and then H squared will be equal to minus one. And so we should interpret the square root of minus one as a unit length perpendicular to the real line over the origin. It didn't catch on until quite a while later, 130 years later. Now to knot diagrams. Uh, well, a knot diagram is another one of these funny things, right? Um, a notation, uh, a notation that happens to be quite iconic. Um, it is actually just a dry diagram that you have drawn in the plane. It is a four regular plane graph with some extra structure at the vertices. Each of those crossings is the four valent vertex. And you are looking at a plane graph with a, with a lot of four valent vertices. But then uh, the drawing convention, which we're all familiar with, says I'm looking at the projection of something from three dimensions. And the ones that are solid are nearer to me than the ones that are open. And, um, and there it is, uh, and I know how to weave it. If uh, you gave me a string or a, or a rope, I can make a weaving of that. And so it's iconic for, uh, um, for an actual rope or weaving. Um, and I can, if I wish, work with the knots by working with these diagrams. And on the other hand, I can take a projection picture and I can ask, is it knotted or not? Uh, like this guy here, uh, and how can you tell? And uh, that leads to all the difficulties in the theory of knots because it just is not so easy to tell whether two knots are equivalent to one another topologically or whether uh, one, of, one given one is unknotted. Uh, maybe you can tell by looking at this whether it's knotted or not. And diagrams of knots appear from the far reaches of science. For example, here from the 1980s is a photomicrograph of a coated DNA molecule, protein coated. Um, Stasiak, Cazzarelli, and Spengler uh, uh, did the lab work here, and they were able to find techniques to coat DNA with protein so that the electron microscope could see it and see it well enough to see that this thick uh, expanded version of the DNA would lie over another one. So you can see that you have a knot diagram. If you get a good micrograph, it turns into a knot diagram for your eyes. And you can see that this is woven. And so that we have a knotted DNA molecule. And this back in the 80s was the first proof that uh, DNA could actually be knotted. But consider the train of events, scientific events, that are necessary to get to this diagram. You need all that technique of, of electron microscopy. You need to be able to do things like coat uh, DNA molecules with protein. You need to be able to isolate DNA molecules. You need to have confidence in all those procedures to the point where this iconic knot diagram appears and you can say, ah, yes, that means that the DNA is knotted. A lot of science in back of that one. Um, and uh, then you can try to locate what knot it is. And um, that is, of course, in general, not such an easy task. There are tables of knots. That goes back to Lord Kelvin's idea that knots are knotted uh, vortices in luminiferous ether. And so Kelvin had the idea, and Tate and, uh, and Little and Kirkwood made tables, and, and we inherit better tables these days, like this one produced by Knotplot, but basically the same table uh, of the knots. The, the, the funny names uh, and the order in which they occur go back historically. They don't mean very much other than, of course, that 3-1 has three crossings and 8-10 has eight crossings. Um, but you could look for the knot there. And if you take that DNA knot and you rotate it by uh, uh, an angle, uh, so that this, this is, of course, the same picture. I just rotated it around. Uh, and then you could look in the tables and you'll find that it looks very much like which one? I 
I just thought I'd give you a moment. Any takers? I mean, there are five crossings, right? Or how many? Uh, how many crossings does that guy have? One, two, three, four, five, six. It has six crossings. Six something. So it should be in the six list. Yeah, and so in the six list, you have six one, six two, six three. Only three. So what's your guess? Oh, is it a guess? Can you see which one it is? Six it two. is one of them. Six two. Six two. It's six two. And, and, and now having been told that it's six two, and you bring your eye back and forth between the picture above it and six two, you can make a point to point comparison. They are the same. So that DNA can at least get knotted at 6-2. Um, there's a lot of other geometry in DNA, and people use pictorial representations to guess a little bit. I mean, here's the um, DNA wrapping around uh, these, uh, uh, these histones, and if I've got the term right, and um, and then supercoiling, and finally supercoiling on supercoiling and turning into the chromosome. Um, it's an artist's representation. I couldn't say how much of this is scientific knowledge and how much of it is artist's representation. A lot of guessing. And no one knows how all the geometry is working down there. Some, a little bit about some, how some of the geometry is working. So for example, it is the case that two bits of DNA can come together. I should have drawn a picture of this, but you see it in my schematics on the right-hand side. Go, by, go from the top one in the middle column to the next one down, and you see that I have two bits of line near one another, which then are turning into a crossing. How did that happen? An enzyme came along and cut them and then recombined them, taking one from the upper one and splicing it to the lower one and vice versa on the other side with a crossover. It's called a recombination. This actually happens with enzymes down in there, has been shown. And you could wonder, well, what about that recombination? Is it a right-handed overcross or a left-handed overcross? Well, you can do an experiment up here in the world of diagrams. You can say, well, okay, let's suppose that's a recombination and it went from K0 to K1, right-handed replacement, and then another right-handed replacement, and then another right-handed replacement, and then another. I can do these experiments very cheaply on paper. And then I can look at what happens, you know. K1 is isotopic to that little link there. If you look carefully at it, you see it's two components and it will slide and turn into that little link. And K2, if you push it around a little bit, turns into the figure eight knot next to it. And K3 turns into another link, an interesting link that people call the whitehead link for some reason that I can't tell you, except that whitehead studied it and it has linking number zero. So I guess I did tell you. Interesting link. And K4, something. Um, well, that's what happens up on paper. But it's possible to do the experiment. You can set it up in the lab so that the successive recombination occurs. And you can look at the resulting photomicrographs. And if you saw this sequence of knots, you'd be pretty sure that it was a right-handed recombination, wouldn't you? And people did. If it had been a left-handed recombination, we would have gotten a different sequence of knots and links. So, so here you have um, a um, amazing interaction between the iconics of the diagrams way up here in, in very cheap experimental space and the um, actualities of what's happening almost invisibly in the biology itself. And, and this is a, a going concern, thinking about uh, biology, molecular biology in terms of knot theory in this way. Uh, where one can use theorems in knot theory to get at some subtle properties of the biology and vice versa. And it promotes thinking about knot theory in a way that probably knot theorists weren't thinking about before. 
thinking about a kind of production line or a knitting machine that is producing many knots by a certain process. Probably that's a quite different idea than knot theorists would have thought of just by themselves. Um, when you make knots uh, by this kind of twisting that you see here, uh, you can make some very interesting knots. For example, here, thanks to Christine, uh, is, a, is a knot made out of a kind of metallic rope which she gave me once for a present. And if you're interested in how to get this metallic rope, I can give you a, a URL. But uh, what you're looking at here is unknotted. And it's not hard to make a knot of this kind by taking the rope and twisting it on itself and then twisting it around itself a bit. The DNA would do this too, um, fairly easily, without too much energy cost to fall into things that are unknotted but more complicated. And then it might undergo a recombination and it would end up being a very complicated knot. Uh, but I want to go off my slideshow now and talk about another experiment, you see. You can do hand experiments with the rope, quite interesting. Make, for example, you can do the following kind of experiment. You, you try twisting these things up by hand, and then you give it to somebody else and you say, is it knotted or not? And they have trouble when they look at it with their eyes. But if they pick it up with their hands, they can easily unknot it. So you have different uh, systems going here. The, the system of, uh, of, of direct geometric manipulation is uh, in a lot of ways much more efficient at understanding what's going on with knots than the eyes. But here's another uh, approach to this. This is a computer program due to Rob Shrine, and I can um, I can give it something. Now I'm going to just use some numbers here and not tell you quite what I'm doing until I've done it. I wrote a little thing in the line, and um, now you see uh, something up on the screen, and there. Okay. Um, what I did was, I told the computer one, two, three, and one, two, three produces a kind of tangling of the kind that I'm saying you could do by hand. It amounts to, um, first you twist by three, uh, two lines, and you twist them around each other twice, and then you twist once. And then I have made a one-two over here um, of opposite kind, and I put them together and close the top and bottom. It turns out that whenever I do that, if I do an A, B, C, and then I do just the A, B, and I do that in that way with the one, the A, B is the opposite signing of the other, I can produce things that are unknotted. This guy is unknotted. What does this program do? This program self-repels the knot as though it were coated with electrical charge. What are we actually looking at? What we're looking at is a collection of points in three-dimensional space, and the program is showing you the intended connection from point to point to point, and we can put a tube around it if we want to. Um, the points uh, pairwise are repelling one another with a one over r to the fifth force. You could do one over r squared, but one over r to the fifth or higher around that um, arena is um, a little more stable for repulsion. And so it self-repels, and if it's unknotted, then sometimes the self-repulsion ends up unknotting it. Let's see what happens here. There's Now we're at the level of the experiment. It's self-repelling.
as you can see, it is unknotted. You can see that it's unknotted now. That loop is rising up past the other one coming out. Um, there's two modes in this program. One is damp, where springs between successive points are held by a very tight spring constant. Or you can allow the spring constant to be a little lower and the springiness between the points is allowed along with the self-repulsion. If I uh, uh, undamp it, it will very quickly um, unknot, but it's a little less stable. So now we have an experimental uh, arena in which to examine unknottedness. I could give it a more complicated one. Let's just give it a more complicated one. Just a little more complicated. One, two, three, four, let's say. And one, two, three. Um, all right. Oop, too fast. Well, we can watch it. There it is. Um, one, two, three, four, you see, and one, two, three. Um, and um, the theorem is that whenever you do that, you'll A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, and then truncate that other one and put them together, you get an unknot. You, get, you can make unknots that are quite large and interesting, complicated unknots in this way. And then wonder whether the forces in the program are sufficient to unknot it. Here it's rather slow because of the damp version, but let's undamp it and control that a little bit. Oh, I run into mechanical difficulties here. Uh, well, this is a very interesting mechanical difficulty. Um, in this program, It's actually a source of experiment. In this program, uh, if, if you, um, sorry, I need to control something there. Um, in this program, uh, a tube can bump into, a line can bump into another line and get kind of stuck. Okay, that happens. Um, the author of the program, Rob Shrine, uh, figured out a very nice uh, way to fix that. His method of fixing it is that if you have two lines that are bumped into one another, you can set the program so that each one creates a particle and the two particles repel one another and then the lines push apart and then it goes on evolving. So you have this creation mechanism of particle pairs from the vacuum. Um, and then with, if you do experiments of this kind, uh, they're rather uncontrolled, but whole universes can start evolving out of a, out of a, a glitch like this one. Um, but uh, uh, that uh, version of the experimental uh, realm is um, very uncontrolled, and I know very little about it. I'm going to go back to the one we were experimenting with. And... Do it again. There we go. That's the one. And we started damped. But I will give it a little bit of that bead repulsion just in case it needs it. So what I wanted to do is see whether this would or not. So now let's use the undamped and control it a little bit. I'm removing kinetic energy because when you have the springs around, geometry can turn into kinetics. So it looks like it. Uh, I managed to unknot that one. Yeah. Now, you can well imagine that uh, if I give it a more complicated one, it'll get stuck, and it will. Uh, and uh, I don't want to 
uh, worry you about uh, what that looks like too much. It's just you see there's a whole range of experiment that's possible here. Um, and, um, and then I got interested in uh, whether a more powerful program could uh, unknot uh, this uh, than just the self-repulsion. And Rob informed me that secretly hidden in his program was a much more powerful Monte Carlo algorithm for unknotting knots. And uh, so that one um, turns the given knot into one on a lattice. I'll, I'd be glad to show this to people offline. I'll just describe it here. It puts the knot on a lattice, and then it's good at trying to find least lattice versions of knots. And if it's unknotted, it will be pretty good at unknotting it um, by this Monte Carlo method. And, uh, and then I started giving it um, knots of the kind that I've been showing you, and after a little while I found some that it really couldn't do. I mean, I left it running for 48 hours, and it, it just was basically stuck. Um, and so, um, so I'm happy that this method of producing unknots that, uh, that we have here, which is due to myself and Sophia Lambropoulou, um, provides a, a, a nice collection of uh, test uh, uh, unknots for programs that might unknot knots. Um, there are uh, algorithms which are guaranteed to work, but they can be very long searches. So this is this is genuine uh, experimental knot theory. We won't go on forever. I'll go on for another 10 minutes. There's more in the slideshow, but I thought that you might enjoy seeing that experiment. Um, then... Um, Another kind of experiment. Oh, I see there's a sound in this. I'll shut up then. Here I'm producing a knot, and then I'm making it a little more complicated, and then I make it even more complicated. And you might think, well, that's certainly knotted. But again, there is the problem, but this shows this is very interesting to watch physically how something actually becomes unknotted under a force. That was the starting point. Uh, this is a famous magician's trick. Um, but you can you can produce lots of things like this knots, which when you pull on the ends will end up unknotting. They aren't knotted at all; they just look knotted. And you'll notice a phenomenon in here. As you walk along the rope, you see that oh, there's a knot. You see, uh, there are knots inside, but the knots inside are, are happening as you walk along the rope for a certain distance and then stop. But then the weaving continues, and some of that weaving undoes the knotting that happened before. Uh, this is another one, and I won't go on. Here is a wonderful experiment due to um, William um, Irvine and his student, Just, um, Justin Kleckner, um, from around 2012. And they, for the first time, produced knotted vortices in a fluid. Remember, Lord Kelvin said that he thought that atoms were vortices in the luminiferous ether. And if anything was a good candidate for the analog of the luminiferous ether, it's water, uh, a nice fluid. And it has vortices in it. And why could, don't we see knotted vortices in water? Or why don't we see knotted smoke rings? Or why can't you blow a knotted smoke ring? You can blow a smoke ring. Why can't you blow a knotted smoke ring? Well, Irvine and Kleckner reasoned that if you had knotted lips, you could blow a knotted smoke ring. And they made knotted lips out of plastic using 3D printing so they could tinker with it. And so they go from design to production and back and eventually produce knotted lips down in the bottom there. Uh, and you push those lips through the water, or you push the water through the lips, either way you want to think about it. And uh, because of the airfoil there, 
I mean the foil structure, uh, you will get vortexing along the edge coming out and you produce knotted vortices. Here's an unknotted vortex produced by that method. See, pull back and oops, sorry, pull back and up comes the vortex, which is quite unstable and falls apart rather quickly, this high speed photography. So lots of technology to get at the seeing of this. Here's the knotted template and the knot coming up out of it. And there you see, it's very clear in the high speed photography that they got themselves a trefoil knot. So that's my favorite, more recent real experiment with knots. Uh, and uh, there are lots of questions you can ask, like what, how does it fall apart? It falls apart by, um, by the vortex bumping into itself and recombining uh, and, uh, and then tends to fall apart into unlinked, unknotted circles. Um, we mentioned Kelvin's vortex atoms, so we won't again. Another, another piece of, um, of interrelationship between physicality and knotting, or at least twisting, is the Dirac string trick, which I have illustrated here as a sequence of cartoons. You have a 360 degree twisted belt attached to the inner sphere as an outer sphere and then you can move the belt around without moving its anchors on the inner sphere or the outer sphere and the belt moves around the inner sphere and becomes untwisted completely untwisted a two a four pi twist is the same as no twist at all and if you analyze what is the meaning of this it turns out that it is this it is equivalent to the, uh, a fact about the topology of the group of rotations of three-dimensional space. And it is also related to the Quaternions and the SU2, and the fact that SU2 double covers the rotation group. So it is related to the way signs change in physics. Um, and on the diagrammatic side, you can diagram everything that we were just doing by twisting a couple of strands or a multiplicity of strands of a little fellow attached to a wall like that. And if you rotate around different directions, you get different kinds of quaternion uh, representations. You rotate 180 degrees around a given spatial direction and you can represent I and J and K. And if you then compose them with the belt in place, you get the quaternions precisely, um, where I squared equals minus one corresponds to rotating twice by 180 degrees to get a, uh, a 360 degree rotation. And I to the fourth equals one corresponds to the 720 degree rotation being trivial. And this is diagrammatic and iconic on that level. But then also you can um, use the computer and illustrate all of this, which we did in a film a long time ago. Sorry, I should have turned the sound off completely. You can do this one with a belt easily. The over and then under that's keeping it from twisting, it's the same as holding your hand up and keeping putting a glass on it and going under and back over and your arm is not getting twisted as you do that. There should be wine in the glasses, but it was too hard to do that. And here's where we started with the belt trick. 
up around the inner sphere, 720 degrees of twist around again, no twists at all. And you can do it with as complicated a connection as you care to. Um, how much more should I do? Not too much more. I remind you that um, there is a way of dealing with it entirely graph theoretically when you use this iconics, uh, when you use these diagrams, and that is due to right in my sir. These little moves on the diagrams capture all the topology, not, all, not every question about the topology, but all the different questions about is there a way to move this rope to that one is captured by just doing these moves on the graphs. In the upper left is the Borromean rings, which is of interest because if you remove any one of them, the other two fall apart. You can associate graphs to knots, and I'm going to, in various ways, and I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. Although when you do it this way, that I'm indicating um, by checkerboard coloring the diagram and forming a graph, then the electrical properties of that graph turn out to be related to the Reitermeister moves. Quite interesting. And then I want to talk for a little bit about the simplest sort of relationships with logic and sets in relation to the, these diagrams. So we end up back in the in the Lewis Carroll and Frege category. First of all, there is the matter of the Borromean rings and how green surrounds red and red surrounds blue, but blue surrounds green, that circularity. Where is that in the structure of things? Um, a good question. And then there is another theme of, of general kind, uh, which is often articulated by Buckminster Fuller who said that the knot is in, or said essentially that the knot is independent in information that's independent of the substrate that carries it. You see, you can make the knot out of hemp, you can make the knot out of cotton, but it's still the knot. And you could slide the knot along, starting it in one kind of substrate and let it turn, let it end up being captured by another kind of substrate. So it's a pattern but it's the pattern integrity having to do with the substrate, but not depending on the actual composition of the substrate. And uh, again, at the intuitive level, how, how does it come about that the trefoil is knotted? It is looping around itself. It's worth thinking about that, whether you have a mathematical model or not. And so I'm looking at this in a really simple-minded way of of the diagrams and I see, what do I see? I see a asymmetric relation. See that A is under B. A and I, I will say that A belongs to B and think of this as a kind of set theory. You see, A belongs to B. If it were looping like the middle one, then A belongs to itself. And in a chain language, like the one I've indicated here, um, B is a member of A, A and C are members of B, B and D are members of C, C is a member of D. Um, and in a simple linking, A is a member of B and B is a member of A. This is not standard set theory. Not well-founded, as they say, but uh, not well-founded set theories are regarded as legitimate these days, just a little different. Um, back to the Borromean rings. You can make a braid just showing you some phenomena that are interesting. Here's a braid over here on the left. And if you were to uh, close up the ends, so you take the upper end and bring it all the way around down and connect it with the lower end, the third to the third, the middle to the middle, and the left to the left, you'll get three rings. And it's the Borromean rings. And you see that there's two 
triangular weaving patterns in there. And if you look at one triangular weaving pattern, why there is the scissors, paper, stone pattern again. A is over B, B is over C, and C is over A. That's a weaving pattern fundamentally in these terms. And in terms of our sets, B is in A, C is in B, and A is in C, circular, like that. If you, if you think in terms of this way of diagramming sets, then ordinary sets are, are easy to do for some examples. For example, here I have the set zero, it has no members. The set one has the member, the set zero. The set two has as its members the set zero and one. And the set three has as its members the sets zero, one, and two. Von Neumann's method of producing the natural numbers in, the, in these diagrams. Or maybe you like the Russell paradox and you don't like it, but from the point of view of these set diagrams, A could belong to A, but topologically you can remove it. So no problem with that at that level. Now, um, a little hint of physics. You see, if you allow things to move apart topologically, then you would see that A under B, uh, like that, looks like it has two members. Uh, I mean, B looks like it has two copies of A as member. Uh, but that becomes nothing, uh, it pulls apart. So that members cancel in pairs from multi-sets to sets. Um, and now let me skip around a little bit to finish. Uh, one thing I wanted to uh, tell you about in relation to combinatorial hierarchy and things like that is that one of the things that happens in the base of the knot theory are little algebras called quandals, and sometimes they're not so little, which um, in their uh, initial simplest incarnations embody some very simple discrimination which probably should be integrated with the ideas in the combinatorial hierarchy. Here I have three entities forming a little closed universe involving three, three entities. A and B can interact to produce C. And I say it's a closed universe. B and C can interact to produce A, and A and C can interact to produce B. And A interacts with itself just to produce itself. A little closed universe of three. You can make more complicated ones, but you can hardly make one that's simpler. And you can think of A and B interacting to produce the distinct entity C as indicating that A and B are distinct. So I have a three distinctions that are interacting in this way. It's not associative. A times B and then times C is C times C, which is C. But A times B times C is A times A, which is A. Not associative. A very, very elementary non-associative algebra involving a simple distinction. And it turns out that it will map perfectly over to the knot diagrams by using the following convention, which is a little different from just membership. A and B are labeling edges, and the edge coming out will be labeled by their product, C. Or if A and A were labeling those two, then it would come out A. And then if you watch those moves I told you about, you'll see that it respects them. A and A come together, uh, interact, and you get A, A, which is A, so that move wasn't seen. A bumps into B and becomes A, B, and then it bumps into B again and becomes A, B, B, but A, B is C, and C, B is A, so that's all right. And, um, and similarly, over here, uh, on, the th on the third writer master move, you'll see that all that works, and it means that if you were to color a knot with the three distinctors, and then watch what happens to it as it moves around, it would remain colored by them. Uh, the universe of the three distinctions would keep on living on the knot, uh, no matter what you did to it topologically. And you could, um, you know, so you would find that no matter what you did to that knot, the th number three would still adhere to it in the form of a threefold coloring of it. 
And that means you couldn't get it to the unknot because the unknot could only be colored with one color. And so you end up knowing that the truffle knot is knotted by means of this coloring experiment with it. Um, I don't remember everything I put in here, so I'm just going to skip for a minute or two and stop. Um, I wanted to talk about the Mobius band, I, I could. Um, I wanted to talk about designing switching circuits related to the Mobius band, but I won't. Um, I do want to talk about the Wheeler universe, which is a circularity almost nodding of the universe observing itself and coming into being according to quantum theory at the point of observation, but where was it before that? And one can consider recursions and re-entries um, and fixed points. And, and one can try writing that kind of thing, self-replication. One can try writing that kind of thing using the not formalism uh, a little like this, you see? I have a G and an X, and out comes G operated on by X, GX. And X could operate on itself by a little loop. And um, F could go through that and become F of XX. And if I wanted GX to be equal to F of XX, I would draw the line between them. And then I would have defined an operator G so that G applied to X is F of X applied to itself. In this realm, it's all right to have something applied to itself. The long ago forbidden, you shall not have things act on themselves, goes away in this diagrammatic domain. And you can indicate various things involving recursion and self-reference. Uh, I then would, would have talked about the DNA self-rep, which is very interesting. I'm just giving you a little view of what happens here, and we would get back to the knots a little bit by thinking about the DNA self-rep, and that was the end of the collection of examples that I had in mind to show you. Um, there are lots of examples of diagrammatic structures and how the ideas in the diagrammatic structures are related to lots of things. And um, the real theme of this talk is that by going into that kind of domain, a kind of portmanteau domain where a given diagram could mean many different things, you have a field of association which lets you think about the relationships between many apparently different things, which are in fact which may in fact be tightly related. And there are many experiments that can be done intellectually or scientifically or both. So that is where we'll stop. Wow, thank you, Lou. Um, I don't know if I was the only one to download and install Notplot while you were talking, but um, what an extraordinary thing. <laughs> oh, you downloaded the Notplot? Yeah, it's incredible. Absolutely. Yes, it's a nice, very nice program, easy to run. It has a manual. If you look around, you'll see there's a manual that, because uh, there are many, many bells and whistles there. You should. Uh, yeah, no, amazing. Um, I'll put the uh, URL onto the uh, uh, chat. Okay. While you were showing us it. Uh huh. Right, well, I'm sure there are loads of questions. So who, who wants to go first? John. Hey, uh, Lou, that was great fun. Thanks very much. <laughs> I, I, I love a lot of the things you've done there, but one of them struck me particularly, and that was on knot plot as well, that you put a, an inverse fifth power thing for the repulsion of these things. And that was, or that, that, is, that, is that stuff open source? You, you've already stuck the thing up, Anton. Is it an open source piece of software there? They um, uh, yeah, you can download it for free. And then if you want to be able to store files, you have to pay him a little bit. I think he wants $25 for use of the program, full use but of the Rob, program. Rob, Rob who? Robert Sharin, S-C-H-A-R-E-I-N. S-C-H-R-E-I-N. S-C-H-A-R-E-I-N. Sharin, I've got it. But anyway, beautiful. Um, as you know, I mean, uh, uh, Viv Robinson and myself uh, are interested in having a look at um, some of the ways that particles form minimum energy systems. And I wonder if there's any um, interest 
perhaps from Rob or perhaps from ourselves, if we download this thing and pay them at $25, have a look at having repulsive things that are electrostatic, mm. maybe inverse square, which is what electrostatic does. And attractive oh, oh I, I should say, uh, particularly for you, that if you get in contact with him, yeah. um, he, he is often, if he has the time, uh, and willing to modify the program in, in a direction that you might be interested in. Well, uh, that would be an absolutely fantastic conversation, which I look forward to having with him. So, uh, so, so having a look at putting attractive things and repulsive things in, we can have a look at the way that, 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 that um, electrons form in terms of forming a minimum energy system that's attractive uh, magnetically, but repulsive electrostatically. And have a look at having the way... Viv's looking at the way that nuclear systems form by having something which is both repulsive and attractive electrostatically, but then is, is attractive <coughs> magnetically in stacks. I wonder if this sort of thing could be put into these things. Some of them are not, some of them are not. The protons are... Well, well some of the things you're going to think about are, are, are obviously larger projects. Maybe you want the uh, electromagnetic knots, and then you would have to add, add field structure that's yeah. going to be more oh, it looks complicated. Like, looks, looks like he's a lot of the way there already in terms of the way that he's managed mm -hmm. to move these things around dynamically. Beautiful stuff. Anyway, thanks for introducing that. That's, uh, that's excellent. So no question there, just a comment, really. Yeah. Many years ago, I wrote a program to do just that, what you are talking about, you know, uh, as uh, using uh, the uh, objects, you know, this. and then it's quite easy because you just replicate that. And basically, I did this uh, to study how things move around, uh, packing in uh, into a sphere or something of that sort. So it's uh, quite easily... Uh, Very interesting, Anton. Very Anyway, fascinating mm -hmm. stuff. And... Uh, Beautiful, beautiful visual, uh, visual stuff there. Thank you very much, Lou. Okay, uh, Graham. Uh, yeah, really interesting talk, Lou. Really loved it. Um, is there a general theory of the categorization of knots? I'm thinking about a sort of knot equivalent of uh, the periodic table of the elements or something along those lines. Well, um, uh, there are many uh, in. What I showed you was an invariant of a knot. The number three is associated with the trefoil knot in the yeah. way I explained. Yeah. And, and, uh, and there are many invariants. We, we can calculate a group that, uh, whose isomorphism class is the same when you move the knot around, um, uh, or polynomials that do not change when you move the knot around. Um, so it's often possible to be able to, or cohomology groups, you, you, you can tell that two knots on something and showing that they have a different invariant. Um, and, um, and then there are algorithms, which have been known for a long time, which will actually tell you whether two knots are the same or different, but they're very, very complicated. So we, we, have, the, we have a situation where, um, where it is known whether it is known that it's, it's algorithmically computable, whether two knots are equivalent or not. But in order to actually do it, uh, uh, um, we have these many different levels of, uh, of, of, of things that can be calculated. And, and people ask geometrical and topological questions about knots of other kinds than are they exactly the same? And yeah, yeah. These, invari these invariants and other parts of the theory um, tell us about that as well. Okay. So there's a theory. There's a there's a theory of knots, just as there's a theory of any kind of topological space, that would study different aspects of that. But um, but there is no simple way to produce the knot tables. Right. They've been they've been produced up to at least sixteen crossings reliably, yeah. uh, uh, but you have to do more and more work to get higher and higher. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Presumably, it's uh, an intractable problem, I imagine. To actually make a table, yeah, uh, is yeah, I, I would call it intractable. To really be able to make a table, but in principle, you can make a table. Colin looks like he's going to say something about that. <laughs> I'm but, just remarking. I don't think it's known whether there's a nice categorized. I think Graham was asking, can you actually describe a complete? A system that, that gets the whole whole thing, and I I think it's unknown, isn't it, Lou? I don't think, or yeah. maybe it's maybe it's impossible. I suspect it's impossible, but nobody's proved it so far. I don't know. 
You see, the only way we know how to make a table is we can enumerate all the diagrams and then we filter them uh, by calculating things or looking at them and finding out that some of them are equivalent and some of them are different. Uh, but the filtering process gets more and more complicated as you go up. Okay, so I have, I'm sorry. Yeah, I had a question. Thank you, Lou. Uh, I had a question about the slide on the DNA uh, recombination. Uh, at the at the bottom, you uh, it said capital S equals negative one third. So I want I, I just wanted to ask what what that capital S means or uh, in that context. Uh, right. Um, you remember when I was running my program and I wrote uh, some numbers like one, two, three, four. Um, there, uh, there is a, a nice way of associating fractions to the tangles that I'm using. And if I have a, I'll just tell you in the air, if I have a horizontal twist, I said it's easy to unknot with your hands, right? Yeah. So I said. <laughs> All right, so if I have a horizontal twist like that, I'll call that one uh, oop, and two and three, all right? But if it's a vertical twist, I'm going to call that one third or two thirds or and so on, all right? Um, so, uh, and so then when I'm combining horizontal and vertical twists like here, um, where I've combined uh, a vertical twist of uh, well, I'll just, I don't want to worry about signs, but it's one third and one or one third and two, you see. Um, so this would be two and one third and a fraction thereby, right? Um, and, uh, and it turns out that that system works so that you can assign a fraction to a tangle. And that, that one third was the fact that the, 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 the thing I started with had a vertical twist of one third. Vanessa, Vanessa. Hi. <laughs> Thanks, Lou. Very interesting. Unfortunately, my computer crashed at the part where you were doing the um, plasmid DNA. I believe it was plasmid DNA, was it not? Um, when, when we do a plasmid prep in the lab and we electrophoresis it through an agarose gel, we see three forms of that plasmid, supercoiled, linear and open circular mm -hmm. okay? now my understanding is the reason why we get open circular is it's been nicked on one strand right okay so i am a little bit confused as to what the the knotting of this dna is if if it we were seeing random nicks reducing the knotting i would see several bands but i only see these three my understanding was the reason why the, these are knotted is that one strand is twisted <laughs> you 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 cut one and it, you twist and it twists the whole thing so when you nick it in one strand it it goes into its open circle. And that's what we see on the gel. Now, my query is now, if you're proposing that it's actually knotted, then why aren't we seeing that on the ele electrophoresis? Well, what I understood uh, about the electrophoresis experiments is that um, people, uh, people assign knottedness to things in the electrophoresis uh, on the basis of how fast they go down through the gel. That's right. Because if it was knotted up, it would go more slowly That's or faster. I'm not sure which. Depends yeah, on. Oh, yeah. Uh, faster, I guess. Faster. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, and experimentalists can make sure that they have closed loops or, or at least be able to tell when they have closed loops. Right? 
closed loops. Uh, closed loop DNA. Closed loop DNA. Those pictures that I showed you were of closed loop DNA. Yes. There's no nick in it. See, we'll, you will see different effects depending on your genetic background of your bacteria. So under certain circumstances, um, a type of plasmid in a certain background will give me chains. Mm -hmm. And some, they can be huge, long chains. There you will see the different bands for each set. But you'll still get your open circular and your linearized form. So I'm a bit puzzled now regarding the structures of these plasmids. Yeah, we should talk about that. I, I, I have some I have some papers that I collected where people are showing how they the, that a certain spectrum of knots corresponded to the different um, things that were going down through the gel. And so it may be that they explain in the paper how they know yeah. that those correspond to closed loop DNA. Mm. But that yeah, is the question you're raising, right? Yeah. How do you know what, which is which? Well, I know on the gel, I mean, it's standard, we know, supercoils, linear, open circular. So, you know, the big open circulars will move slowly. And there's three distinct bands. We don't see those. If you nicked in a loop, but the rest is still knotted, we'd see a series of them. And we don't. We only see those three bands, unless you're in this mm -hmm. band, which gives you, yeah, you know, we get the linking. And then the the recombination um, is is that visible? Yeah. The the recombination I can't tell who's yeah the recombination is that there is there are enzymes which will will cut yes. and then recombine it crossing yes. it over. But yeah. We're in back that's to that's a local that's a local effect. I agree. But, but if it happens, it can it can transform an unknotted uh, DNA loop into a knotted DNA loop. Yeah, I'm coming down. Yeah, but we have, I mean, in the background of bacteria, talk, though. you know, they are discovering new um, recombination enzymes all the time. They all do things slightly differently. Right, right. So, again, yes, we may see all these effects, but it's very dependent. You know, the bacteria we use in the lab are generally mutated in some way keep them in the lab really mm -hmm. but also for various cloning purposes you can't put a um a plasmid into one which has re a strong reca it just mashes it up basically unless it's meant to be there so we disable them of all these various recombinant systems and then of course we've got z dna which is switched the other way it's um a left-handed helices and we know that this triggers certain recombination systems and not others. Okay, so that it, this, this whole system is very complex, I suppose, um, what I'm saying. So we have to be a little careful at making... Well, well, yeah, sure. So when people did these experiments where they produced a spectrum of knots, they are controlling the recombination to some specific enzyme that they're interested in. And and they're controlling the experiment as much as they can. Okay. Well, be right. interested to see the paper. Yeah. Definitely. But I am very puzzled about this, you know, uh, straightforward plasmid DNA. When you nick it, it all seems to form one band. Mm hmm Yeah, that, that we've got to really <laughs> somehow... Well, okay. So um, I, will, um, I will look up the... The papers that I know about, which go back some years, and uh, and uh, send them over to you, and and yes, we can please. talk some more. Yeah, yeah, very fun. <laughs> and okay. Then of course we got the high temperature bacteria, which coil them up even more. Mm -hmm. Ability. Okay, uh, Peter Massa has a question, and then Sahu, and then John Williamson as well. So Peter Massa, Sahu. John, no, not John, Mike Horner. Oh God, I can't, I can't read face signals. Anyway, um, Peter Massa. Uh, Lou, uh, uh, um, 
the, the things like the trifold up, anything to do with uh, uh, Jacobi relations or generalized Jacobi relations. I, I didn't get the question. Do you want to say it again? You muted, Peter. Of three things. Uh, and they, they, you could have generalized Jacobi relations, which consist of other... Oh, Jacobi relations? Is that what you're saying? Yes. You mean, you mean like, uh, like the Jacobi identity in the Lie algebra? Is that what yeah, we're talking yes. about? Yeah, that's, a, that's another diagrammatic... Uh, uh, I mean, there, there's some nice diagrams that are associated with that. But what, what, where did that question come from for you? Well, 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 well that, that question comes from the fact that uh, um, uh, I, I have some relationships in, 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 a, in, a, in a paper taken from some Polish gentlemen uh, uh, in, which, uh, in which these are to do with uh, 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 neural networks. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would suggest that... Uh, uh, um, you know, producing a producing untie, unt, uh, untwisting a knot uh, is the means of get uh, is a means by which you approach solving a problem using yeah. the, the brain uh, um, with the brain as a uh, as a, a neural network. Okay, uh, I'm not sure how that's related to the Jacobi identity yeah. question, but. But the way the brain approaches uh, solving a problem, uh, that's what I was saying. It's interesting to compare what you do with your hands when you're dealing with this thing, which looks like it's a visualization problem, but I think it's much closer to what you do with your hands and your body than it is to what you do with your eyes, working with things like knots. Yeah. Yeah, but if it was a way in which the, it, it, it is a way uh, which is the way that the brain had chosen to uh, uh, build up uh, build up a, a network of uh, of, uh, of of neural relationships mm -hmm. in, or, in order to solve a problem. Right. Right. Uh, um, I mean, I can send you a, a, a paper on this. Oh, sure, please do. But let me make a comment about Jacoby. I'm looking for a piece of blank paper, uh, which may or may not resonate with you. I don't know, but uh, but it's not going to sound like Jacoby at the beginning. I'm going to. Oh, maybe I should start with something that does sound like Jacoby. I just drew a little diagrammatic equation. You can read it, right? Can you lift it up a bit, Lou? Yeah. There it is. Okay, yeah. All right. Now, you see two vertical lines, and then they change their position. So this is like A times B minus B times A. So this, what you're looking at here is a diagrammatic picture of a commutator, A times B minus B times A. And over here, you're looking at a, a funny other thing. But that funny other thing A funny other thing could be the structure constant FABC for a Lie algebra. And so I have written that the commutator of TA with TB is equal to the sum over the indices of the structure constant times the other Lie algebra elements. That is effectively the Jacobi identity um, when you 
are describing a Lie algebra. You're describing how the commutators of something uh, are given by some other elements. But it's just, I've described it diagrammatically. And the reason I point that out to you is because you can think of that, those three diagrams, as all associated with this one collapsed diagram, so that you resolve this singularity in one way so that the two lines are parallel. You, re, uh, you resolve it the other way so that the two lines cross over, or you resolve it another way so that you pull up and get a, a distinction between them so that you go from four to three. Uh, and you go from four to three in three basic ways, and they're related, and that relationship is the Jacobi identity. So the Jacobi identity becomes the way in which a singularity is resolved in the network. And so if you're thinking about the Jacobi identity that way as how a certain singularity in a network gets resolved, then it isn't so strange that the Jacobi identity might be occurring in some essential form in neural networks or other things like that, biological yeah. networks. Yeah, well, that's what, that's and it what does occur in knot theory in that way. Yeah, that, 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 that's, what I'm, that, that's, that's, what, that's really what I'm talking about. That uh, effectively, uh, we're talking about phase gates and uh, we can gradually condense a whole set of uh, different phases down so they form just one, one, one phase, and that's the solution to the problem. To put it in a, uh, in a particular way. Uh, but I'll, 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 I'll send you, I can send you the paper. Great, great. Okay. Um, Sahu. Yeah, Lou, so I had a question about the Borromean rings. Uh, and, and what you had shown on the slide, and I wanted to share uh, this. If, can you, can you oh, sorry, hang on. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you say something, Sahu? So I can... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, are you are you showing us something? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Ah. So I'll keep talking so <clears throat> so yeah. my screen shows up. Yes. But you, you see what I'm doing here, and I, I just. Uh, wanna... I need to see it again. Uh, oh. You can't Maybe just if on. you move or tap or something, okay, it will. Yeah, I'll just keep making some sound. Wait. Yeah. There we go. Is there a way yeah. to make a, a given person's I small think, window think, large? Yeah, Matt, yeah, so can you uh, uh, can you spotlight uh, Sahu? You can pin my video too. Well, so spotlight. Spotlight. Mark can do. I can spotlight, can I? Oh, I don't know how to do that. Hang on, let me just a uh, little bit of a spotlight. Yes, there we are. Awesome. Okay. Is is it reversed for you? Because it looks reversed. No, no it's fine. So you wrote A equals A, then you wrote B C B C equals A. Yep. And then. Remember, I... it's non-associative though, so take care. Right. Uh, so this. C B becomes A, is that wrong? Uh yeah, you reassociated it. And then I get this, which is fine, right? Is that uh, how it mm. dynamically or, or what? Well let's see. C B is A and then, yeah. then um, B and then A C is B and B B is B. I mean, depending on how you associated it, you're gonna get A's or B's or C's, right? Yes, yes. So I don't know how you associated it since you didn't tell me in your text. Oh, sorry. So I just, uh, I did A, B, or uh, uh, B, A equals C here. And but C, C, C is not equal to A. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, but that's what I'm saying. It's non-associative. So if you, if you uh, don't respect that, then you could collapse it. it doesn't is that clear? Is it clear? If you, if you use the associative law as though it were present, then A equals B equals C. The only way that A and B and C remain distinct is by disallowing the associative law.
Okay, so so you you can restrict you can restrict the rule um, to prevent this from happening. Is that what you're saying, or uh, you or? think that you think uh, or rather, it's not you who think, but you know, one's reflexes um, have one uh, uh, doing associativity when algebra is presented to one because one has been trained to do that. But all I had here was a system of symbols that uh, a system of interactions, and those interactions are not associative. So you're not you don't get to use associativity. Okay, now I understand. Yes. So I, I basically was very, uh, very uh, open with my parentheses and <laughs> just shifting. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Thank okay, you. thank you. I, I'd oh, all right. It's very interesting. Like when you use the Cayley Dixon process and produce algebras out of algebras, and you produce from the complex numbers the quaternions, and you relax and it's associative. And then you go one more and you do the same process, and you, oops, non associative anymore, right? Um, we're not quite used to using non associative things uh, consciously, but there are lots of them. Like, suppose I defined A times B to be A minus B not associative. Okay, uh, Mike Horner. Okay. Uh, uh, Lou, right at the beginning, uh, you used the trefoil knot, and then you said if it was split, then um, you end up with Mobius bands. And also later uh, I, on... I'm sorry, what did I say? You, you said uh, the trefoil knot in split down the middle became two Mobius spans. Oh, oh, that's beautiful. You you said it perfectly backwards from the way I said it, which is fine. No, no, I mean, you, you, that's the way, later on, uh, you, you uh, promised... No, wait, 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 wait. But I mean, uh, it, it, it's just interesting about processing because why should I, why should we expect you to remember exactly the way I said it? But you said it, what you did say is exactly the opposite of what I said. Okay. So, well, promise... so let me say again what it was that I said, okay? What I said was, um, and I'll demonstrate it, in fact, up to a point. What I said was that if, like Escher, you form a Mobius band, uh, then there's a nice experiment. You can cut it down the middle and see what you get. Right. But you can form many Mobius bands. You can, instead of doing one half twist, you can do three half twists, and it'll yeah. still be Mobius. So you're gonna have okay. a three half twisted Mobius band. Right. You cut that down the middle, you get a trefoil knot. Right. Now, that, my question is, that if the trefoil knot is really, really basic, is the Mobius band something even more basic? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and have you, you did promise to speak about Mobius band, but you said you'd run out of time. So I hereby request that you speak about <laughs> Mobius bands in that sense, if you've got anything to say. Oh, all right. Um, let me go back to the slideshow and find out where it was I was going to say that. So I can show you what it was I was going to say. Uh, okay. Um, well, this... This isn't proving that the Mobius band is basic, but it's proving that you could use it to think about something topological. Um, namely, uh, Lou, do you want to share your screen? Oh, I thought I was. <laughs> Somewhere there's this control here. There, all right, there. There, all right. Well, there's a problem. You ask a mathematician to say something basic and, he, and instead he shows you his favorite particular example. But, uh, but, uh, but I can't resist. Um, the, this, um, uh, better this way. This guy here, is almost a Klein bottle. I have drawn a Klein bottle where I have removed something. You have to put in a disc here, and then right. it would be intersecting itself, and it would be a Klein bottle. Right. Okay. 
So that's a Klein bottle. Um, and um, and then what I've done here is I've taken the Klein bottle and I've added uh, a Mobius band to it. So the Klein bottle is is doing its funny tubing thing on a on a Mobius band. So you're on this Mobius band and you can go down through the tunnel of the Klein bottle and end up on the other side of the Mobius band locally. Yeah. Okay, let, let me give you a bit of context for my question. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm sorry. I should skip this because we don't have a lot of time. It's okay. just that there is a very cute way of using the Mobius band to understand how something gets turned into something else because you have a tube which goes attached to a Mobius band and then you slide the tube all the way around the Mobius band and it goes from being attached locally to the two sides to being attached to one side. And okay. you trans topologically transform something into something else. So the Mobius band is a, is a nice little operator like that, but we'll talk about general ideas. The general idea is the following, that locally the Mobius band is true locally like having true and false yeah but globally if you went all the way around the mobius band you flip from top to bottom from one side to the other or from true to false so that you can think of a paradoxical situation as the global situation but the local situations are not so paradoxical and so one of the things one of the ways of saying what you do to avoid paradox is you make certain trips in your uh, world unavoid, uh, avoided. You avoid certain trips in your world. Yeah, and then you won't get the paradoxes to happen. Okay. Can, can I... Uh, can that, I in fact is, that, in fact, is one of the ways in which we avoid paradox. All right. We, uh, we avoid... Can, I'm try, trying to get your conversation down to one of your other subjects, let's say... Uh, I, uh, wait, well, but I, I'll get there. Uh, it's just that I, I have a, a tendency to start with the particular and get to the general. Suppose I said to you, the key thing about human language is that it's equal to its own meta-language. That anything I, I say, I can <laughs> comment on what I say. And what I comment is still part of the language. I never get out. It twists around on itself. Language twists around on itself. And, and if you allowed yourself to say anything you liked, you would be in paradox easily, okay. very easily. And every single field of study makes certain lines that you're not allowed to cross so that they don't get the paradoxes that they don't want. Okay. But, but the structure of the whole is more like a Mobius band than it is like uh, an orientable thing where the, all the distinctions would be present. Okay. I'm, I'm trying to get you to think in the biology part of your promises. There is an idea. Oh, oh no, I heard you. I heard you. You I'm said. Finished yet. I'm finished. Yeah. Yet. Mike, sorry. Mike, Mike, sorry. I'm yeah, nearly, I'm nearly finished, Mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah keep no, going. Fine. Keep going. In, in the world of cells and veins and arteries, there is a suspicion by surgeons and people who deal with that stuff that the vast number of circuits of arteries and, uh, and veins form Mobius bands. And there are little ones down at the cell level which is where energy interchange takes place. I come across this several times in the last five years. So I'm, I'm getting a hint from biology. I hope Vanessa can help here, <laughs> that there's something fundamental with Mobius band structures in, shall we say, living systems. Well, there might well be, right? There might well be. Yeah. Th this is a very physical thing that can happen. You take that three half twisted Mobius band and, and if you were to split it like that, then there's nodding that comes out of it. Right. And I once met a biologist. Her name is Dietrich Condor. Maybe she's still a biologist. I don't know. 
um, it was many years ago, and she was trying to convince um, experimentalists to look for this phenomenon in biology. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, hang on, I can't see everybody. Right. Any more questions? Sahu. Uh, while we're on the topic of biology, I was remembering the an endoplasmic reticulum. Like there's a smooth and rough type. Uh, like there's a distinction between the smooth endoplasmic reticulum and a rough, and the rough one is usually studded with these. I'm wondering if those 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 uh, hyperplasia is some some kind of a knot or you know is 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 that reticulum kind of knotted in a way? I, I don't know if if this is a big stretch, but it really reminded me of the the latter half of your presentation with the outer boundary sort of wiggling into the center. Uh, hmm. So do you uh, know about the, yeah, I, if you could send if you could find some uh, images? papers about that, it'd be interesting for us to look at it. And maybe Vanessa has something to say to you about that. I am ignorant mm -hmm. of what you're asking. I'll find something and post it on the chat. Okay. Any more questions? All right. Well, I think I think that's that's uh, probably everything. Lou, that was fantastic, and um, and thank you so much because uh, I'm going to be playing with uh, not plot for some time now. I think, and um, uh, yeah. Oh, I guess I wanted to say something. Um, there, there's been a speculation for a long time that that interpreting the Quaternions physically the way I did, uh, you know, with uh, uh, with uh, Beltric. That 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 then the then the quaternions are actually in three dimensional space, right? Um, but usually when we're working with them in quantum theory, they're sort of separated by some algebra or something, uh, or the way you think of unitary transformations occurring. So I've always found that puzzling. It feels right that the quaternions are right there in your hand, and on the other hand, in order to work the quantum theory, they feel a little separated. And I was wondering whether John had a comment about that. So this is the question mostly to John. Okay. Yeah, I think the um, I, I, I think the quaternions are embedded. Um, I think there's a multiple embedding going on here. So um, so the quaternion algebra, the three-dimensional algebra, is at the basis of. Um, the most fundamental part of the four-dimensional algebra in which it's embedded. So, um, so yes, I think there is an embedding, if that's the answer to the question in terms of these things, in terms of a higher dimension algebra, which we've talked about as, which we've talked about as well. But it's, um, it's a different three-dimensional algebra to the basic three-dimensional algebra of three dimensions of the three-dimensional space, which is the base algebra of those quaternions. So the embedding so you have, you, you have a multiple embedding. You have a three-dimensional algebra, which includes time. And then that three-dimensional algebra within itself gives you a quaternion algebra. When you, when you add, a, add a, a product to that, you have the product of x cross y, y cross z, and z cross x, which are, together with the scalar part, are isomorphic to the quaternion algebra. So there's this quaternion algebra, which is sitting at a four-dimensional algebra one side up and one side down from the three-dimensional algebra which is generating it but then it comes back in the way that peter talks about in terms of things that are very nearly quaternion algebras at the level of the quadrivectors uh, of the trivectors so the trivector algebra also looks in many respects like a quaternion algebra um and then it comes back again in the other algebras, which are the three algebras of the four dimensionals of the subsets of the four dimensional algebras. So they can be related to those by judicious addition to the, those aspects of the four dimensional algebra of the square root of minus one of I. So that's, which I don't think really necessarily makes things any similar, but yes, there is an embedding of the quaternion algebra within the three dimensional plus one, three plus one algebra of four dimensional space time. So um, I think the answer is yes, they are related, but they're not the same as three-dimensional space, which is the thing that generates them, but they are embedded in it. 
Yeah, you come very close to Hamilton's original insight. He tried and tried to get something like the Quaternions, and then he realized, ah, oh, if I go to four space, yes, they're there. The, tr the, the thing is that, that the Quaternions are like a double covering of the three space as well, because yes. if you go around these things any direction, you get around a kind of minus where you, where you, where, where you are, so the things are double covering mm -hmm. of this. So, exactly. So it's also a, areas. Areas. They are effectively areas, exactly. They're, they're, areas so, of Quaternions. Perpendicular things to something else, but then when you're a force space, there is no perpendicular. So, so and then they become multiply embedded, which is partly what, which which is why I'm fascinated by what Peter's doing as well, because he sees a Quaternion set and another Quaternion set, which are which are which are which are which are, which are yeah, kind of that's two right, yeah, interacting with the two Quaternion sets. Yeah, exactly. it's not quite perfect, but I think that that it's looking at different aspects of the same elephant, four-dimensional elephant. So, but but. but yeah, no, it's a, uh, yeah, it's a mind going so, into connection, really. So I, I think I should leave you with the exercise of doing the quaternions in your hand. You can do this. So if you would do this, I, I usually do this with an, uh, a real audience. I mean, an audience that's across the room from me, but hold your hand out uh, horizontally and um, uh, turn it by 180 degrees. That is I. Turn it 180 degrees around the vertical toward your body, and that is J. And turn it um, by 180 degrees around the horizontal line going across your body, and that is K. And you have now done I times J times K, and your hand is twisted by 360 degrees, which is I times J times K is minus 1. So let me do that again. I, this is I. Um, uh, this way, if you um, if you then go around the vertical, that's J, and if you go this way, this is K. I'll do it directly. This is K, going around the body this way. So, um, so if I do I, and then I do J, and then I do K, I have minus one, and so I times J times K is minus one, and you have the quaternion. You should try that if you didn't. Or just hold out your hand and do it, and you see that the quaternions are on your body, just like the, the fillin and the, and the mezuzah. It's on your body. That's a beautiful demonstration, but in fact, we, we already see there's a pair of quaternions in there, because if you do the I squared or the J squared or the K squared, which is, almost mi which is also minus one, you won't have to twist. So there are mm -hmm. two minus ones in there. There are two different minus ones. And that's at absolute, so, so, so they, you get into the, in, in the two sets of things which are sitting on top of one another, the two minus, but they, are really, they should really be distinguished. One's a twist about an axis, and the other one's a direction, and they, they are different kinds of minus one. Yeah, another, another way of getting the pair is, you see you had two concentric spheres. Yeah. It's another yeah, talk. It's, two concentric yeah. spheres, and we were turning the inner sphere to make the quaternions. Yes, exactly. If you turn yeah. the outer sphere, you have the other pair. The other quaternion yeah. pairs turn the outer sphere instead of the inner sphere. I, I think the other thing that's 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 opposite here is thinking about the very phase of what's happening when you're doing the IJK. You get an extra, um, you get an extra 180 degrees in the space you're looking at there from the fact that you're enclosing a solid angle as well as as well as changing an angle about a, about an axis. So and I guess the very phase was sort of much much later, of course, than Hamilton. But uh, I think that's also something which. Mm -hmm. It's important in, in doing these rotations that one does with one's hand. The, uh, this is an okay. exercise in uh, Tai Chi, isn't it? This, uh, my wife uh, does uh, some Tai Chi exercises to keep, uh, to keep fit. And uh, one of the simplest ones is to do what Lou did, but uh, keep on going until you come back uh, more or less to the same the same Gra place. grasp the bird's tail yeah 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 you go except you you go right around the body with the, you, you know you've got a you put you put a you put something in which you could have uh, liquid in it and you move it you move it around by uh really uh well what it's what so it says that it's really some kind of twofold covering mm -hmm. and you come back and but you need not spill any of the any of the liquid 
Right. The, the, as, in our, as in the movie I showed, where she didn't have any wine in her glasses so that yeah, we didn't have to right, spill. Yeah. 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 Well, this, this is what this uh, demonstrator does on uh, when, when they exercise, when, they, when she shows, uh, shows you, uh, the pupil, what you've got to do. Uh, and then you do that several times, and it's, uh, it, it, of course, it's, um, it, 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 I guess, in some sense, it exercises at, you know, all the muscles. Uh, 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 and uh, in doing it, of course, it also exercises the, uh, uh, the, 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 the brain. And what they seem to have discovered is that... Um, uh, rather than doing these very hard exercises on, say, exercise bicycles, which are also very good for you, if you just do these kind of exercises using Tai Chi, then uh, you you, uh, you you get the same health gains as uh -huh. as, the, as the heavy exercise in practice, uh, but really with it, without apparently uh, doing any. Uh, hard exercise, but really you have actually exercised the entire muscle system of the body in order, in order to do it. And it's the, uh, it, it's getting the balance right, getting the balance right that allows you to uh, do that. So, so there must be somebody here, probably somebody putting their hand up now who knows. And Barbara, more yes, more Barbara. Yeah. Someone, Someone described Tai Chi to me as, as the ancient martial art of killing people very slowly. I don't know if Barbara... <laughs> that. No, I mean, it's, it's all matter of energy. The, the way the energy goes in our body. I mean, you have, of course, in Tai Chi, uh, in Orthodox Tai Chi, you will have uh, channels and so, which in the Western medicine we don't recognize. But the fact is that there is some energy going to our body and Tai Chi allows you to direct this energy. And there are some very special exercises that you can you can sort of by twisting your your arm in a certain way you can get the spiral energy going forward. It's it's mm. amazing, but of course it needs exercising, and it's not just muscles. It uh, we say in uh, I I practice Tai Chi not very regularly, but I do. Uh, we say that the mind leads the body, so you have this body mind here, and that. That actually is uh, when you when you see people uh, the really uh, exercising, really practicing Tai Chi, you can see how uh, how focused they are. And that's that's the that's uh, and then it can become martial art. You you can you can exercise with somebody else and you can almost transfer energy to to each other just by using very tiny uh, arm movements so it's really and it's it's in a way gentle exercise but you can kill somebody if you know how to use the energy mm. <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah well that's it's yeah it's it's wonderful um right i think we should probably stop because we have we we we're gonna have uh, as, as peter has helped me to phrase this we're going to have a general meeting at eight o'clock so that means in one hour yes yeah mm -hmm. yeah okay. um so uh and on monday rachel can you um, give us a quick so, crazy yeah so like my talk is actually very much a continuation of this one um so i'm gonna give an anecdote of this realization i had in childhood about thinking about how we experience reality then I'm going to talk about Shades Allwager's logic off of it. Ah. Hmm. Um, and then I'm going to talk about like an isomorphism between the logic alphabet and the Clifford algebra that I found um, a paper about earlier this year. Um, and then a little bit about AMPA veteran Eddie Oceans and how he found the relationship between the quaternions and physical movement. And then finally, um, I'm gonna think about hula hooping as a way to extend that. So I have like a hula hoop and a ribbon. Oh, and brilliant. <laughs> maybe I can crowdsource representing the octonians or the quaternions of the movement, but I haven't figured it out yet. I need your help. Okay, well, that, that, well that's, that, I'm, it sounds great. Look forward to it. Okay, so I think we should have a short break for an hour. And um, for those of you who want to come to a general meeting,
at eight o'clock uh, UK time, which is I don't know what time that is in America. Um, uh, same, same same Zoom. Ah, um, now now Netflix. now, hang on. Um, uh, can we do it on the same one? Why not? Right, I've, that's what that's what I'm going to spend my hour doing. Um, does everybody want to come? Can can you just uh, type in the chat if you want to come and. Um, I've, I've just got to think about organizing this. What I'll do, I'll put the link into the AMPA chat. It may have to be a different link. Um, okay. When, when we set up Zoom. So we look for your, we'll look for your link. Look for, yeah. look for my link, sorry. Yes, I should have thought about right. it. It's been a long day. Right. Okay. Okay, I'll see you in an hour's time. Oh, oh excuse me. I, I wanted to say something to Sam. Are you there, Sam? Lamonaco? Uh, is he there? Not there? Okay, never mind. I'll, get, I'll contact no, him. Yeah. 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 But it, he may have done what I do when I turn my camera off, which is <laughs> go and do something else and listen to it passively. <laughs> That's all right. I'll get in touch oh, with him. Okay. All right. We'll see, see you a bit later. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.